one of the challenges in doing data uh, in the real world is you run into these problems all the time. Um, I, I, it's, uh, you know, um, getting good measure, it, getting good measurements is difficult. We're, we're looking, we can come up with theory. We have theory and the theory tells us certain things. Um, and, and the theory can be very solid, but you have to put good, good data into that to, to make sense. So that is, uh, that's, that's, can be difficult at times. Um, I was talking last week about, um, about India and, uh, and, and, and the, the situation there. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, when I, I want, as I said, um, I wanted to prepare to look at the labor, use the labor statistics to, to get an understanding of, uh, of, of the labor market and the types of jobs people are doing. Uh, it, 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 the, the, the data does not make any sense. It's complete, uh, it's, it, uh, it just didn't make any sense. I, I don't know what anybody would use, how you would use it. I don't even know how, uh, I, I wouldn't ask any student to try to make, uh, to use it for anything. Because I, I, you, I don't know how you analyze it. It's, you, you can see there's missing data, new stuff, all, it, it, it's, it's just a very, uh, it, it's, it's a country that because so much economic activity uh, is a cash uh, activity, it's just hard to tell and, and pe uh, what's actually going on. And, and in fact, people are spend a great deal of energy to avoid paying taxes, uh, especially businesses. So, and that's part of the problem. Uh, part of the problem uh, in, uh, in India uh, has been because so much of, 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 the, of the economy is a cash economy, uh, that the government uh, is, uh, the, the, the government cannot, cannot collect enough tax revenue to, to build infrastructure to, to, help the, to, to help the economy to grow. Uh, India has a real problem with infrastructure, a lack of roads uh, and a lack of, uh, uh, and, a, and a lack of water, sanitation, many, all, oh, many, many dif different types of infrastructure that we take for granted in a country like this is, is lacking. And one of the big problems is, is that the Indian government can't collect enough, enough taxes. Uh, individuals don't pay enough tax. Uh, businesses don't pay tax. Everybody uh, avoids taxes. So, um, and also, um, the the individual states appear to have, the, as, as I as I mentioned, uh, in India ha is almost like thirty separate countries and operates as thirty separate countries. So one of the reasons for this, I, I talked about the demonetization. Uh, the, 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 the reasons are um, to, to reduce illegal transactions so that you can tax, <clears throat> um, uh, to, to collect taxes. Uh, if, you have a, um, if you have a tax, uh, for example, uh, 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 like the Shohize uh, tax, you, you have to have, be able to collect that tax from merchants. You have to be able to, to go to the merchants and for the merchants to show you their, their records. Uh, now, so in this country, the, the records are all electronic. So, so you, you, if, you, if you ring up, if you have a sale, it has to be done on a machine, and the machine has to record it electronically, and you have to give the customer a receipt, and the receipt shows, like this receipt that I just got for, uh, for this, tells me how much tax I paid, and I paid, uh, I paid uh, 19 yen of tax. So, uh, so the, um, but in India, it, the, the shopkeepers are, it's everything is cash, they don't report anything, nothing gets reported, no taxes is collected. So that's one of the things that they want to do is reduce uh, the illegal transactions. Uh, the other thing is to promote the use of electronic monetary uh, uh, transactions. Uh, and that's part of collecting taxes. 
that they, 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 they want to have more electronic, uh, electronic tra transactions so that the government can track, uh, uh, can track transactions. And why do they want to track transactions? Of course, for the purpose of, of collecting taxes. Um, probably Indian people are very distrustful of their government. Uh, the government doesn't work very well uh, in India, uh, so that that has been uh, that's been a problem. So, um, so pe pe people feel like the government is corrupt, and that, that they're just there to steal money from uh, uh, from the ordinary people and and not provide any infrastructure anyway. So he's he's trying to change. Prime Minister Modi is trying to change the mindset of uh, of Indians. And the, the first way, as I say, is the demonetization, which was announced in a, in a surpri complete surprise. This was announced in a complete surprise uh, last November the 8th. Absolutely no one knew this was coming. On the other hand, what they did know uh, was the goods and services tax. Uh, and as I said, the goods and services tax uh, is, is a national goods and services tax that uh, uh, it's a VAT tax, what we call the, the Shohize uh, here in Japan. And, and, and what it is, is at every point, the value that's added by the transaction is what's taxed. So, for example, here, uh, the, the Shohize, that, that's the collection. But for, for what was paid for the good, for, for, for what was paid for the good, the tax that was paid before that is deducted. So it's actually just at each point in uh, in the stream, only the value added is is collected, and that's why you call VAT. When you see the VAT, that means value added tax. So, so that's what the kind of tax that it is. This has been uh, under discussion in India for uh, the last, I believe, 15 years, uh, uh, since about 2003, I believe, at least 2003. There's been talk about uh, uh, about doing this. What it is, uh, it's it's the first time taxes on the sale of most goods and services will be will be the same. So they're unifying taxes across across the states, across the Indian states. So that if you buy a product uh, in, in 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 one state, you go to another state, that there'll be a, the same tax on the same product. Uh, it's still uh, it's still a very complicated tax. There's a number of different there, there's a number of different categories. They're taxing items in different ways. Whereas in this country, everything is taxed at eight percent. If it's subject to the value added tax in Japan, it's a, everything is taxed at one rate. In India, there the way this tax is working, I think there's at least four. Actually, there's many different rates, but four main rates that I've, that I've read about. And then there's exceptions. F certain foods are, 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 are accepted. Certain products are taxed more. Other products are taxed, are taxed less. So it's actually, it's still very complicated. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, but one of the things about this is that now, since the tax is, is the same, the the, go the national government is going to is going to know how much tax they're collecting, they're, they're, and along with demonetization, and 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 uh, the um, oh, one of the things that the shopkeepers now have to become elect some type of electronic. Uh, so even the small shop even small shopkeepers, uh, they they can't have just cash transactions anymore. It has to be recorded on a, a cash register. And one of the problems is that still most of the most of the, the merchants, the small merchants, don't have cash registers. So it's um, uh, it's going the, the the tax did go into effect on July first of this month. So it's uh, uh, it did go into effect, um, but it's going to take time. So basically, they're putting the tax into effect. They're, they're giving a little bit of a grace period for, uh, for especially for small merchants. Uh, they'll have to get uh, uh, they'll have to get the machinery. At the same time, they're promoting more electronic transactions so that then the government can better monitor uh, the, the the economy. Um, 
one of the very interesting effects uh, of, of this has been the, the immediate elimination of border checkpoints at, at, at states. And because the different states had different taxes, when goods that were entering one state from another state was like a border checkpoint. So, so, so vehicles, if, if the trucks that are carrying goods from one state to another had to, had to stop at the border, and then they're checking the papers to see what they're bringing in to make, uh, in, in order to make sure that they collect the tax uh, on the on the goods in that state. It's um, uh, basically what it meant was that India was in effect different countries. Each state was was its own country. Well, that's you're not going to have a powerful country. Uh, when when, when a, a society acts like that, you take goods between prefectures, you cross prefectures, and you don't even care. You 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 don't care uh, uh, what um, you 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 cross one prefecture to the next. It doesn't matter in in terms of uh, of moving goods uh, and, uh, and 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 services. Um, but in in this country until now. Uh, now that means that some states will still have border checkpoints. Um, the what's interesting, I was reading an article uh, in in the India, the, the Times of India, that said although they've eliminated the checkpoints, um, state officials are still stopping vehicles after they enter, to um, uh, based on other on other excuses. Uh, what we call pretext, and basically one of the things that they're also doing, they're, they're trying to force them to pay bribes. So this is part of the, um, uh, so this pro the problem is not going to eliminate, uh, right? it's, it's going to take time. So, um, uh, but the, uh, uh, my, my ultimate point here is that, uh, is that India is changing it's, I, I think we're going to see a, a, a real emergence of, of the country as a significant uh, economic power uh, as they solve these problems, as they reduce corruption, as, as they make, uh, create a unified national market. Um, these are, are, are major, major changes that, uh, that, are, finally, uh, that are finally being made. I, I think it's very encouraging. Um, as I say, when you look into it, there's still a long way to go. Uh, they, they still have a, a, a long way to go and a lot of problems uh, to solve. But uh, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's a very interesting, it's still what's going on. It's very interesting. Um, and I think it's a country worth watching. I think it's important. Um, I think Japan's going to be trading a lot. There's going to be a lot of trade. I think there's a lot of, of opportunity uh, for Japan to trade with uh, 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 with uh, with India. I think it's going to be a, uh, uh, these two countries are going to be important trade partners. Um, uh, Japan has a lot of investment in China, of course. Uh, probably uh, Japanese companies are going to look to have more investment. In, in India, as the infrastructure develops, as the corruption is reduced, as it becomes a signal market, uh, as all of these things happen, I, I think Japanese investors will will, uh, will be very interested uh, in uh, in that, as well as security. Uh, security, um, uh, the uh, countries around um, uh, around Asia are going to look at checking China. You know, China is expanding its power. Uh, and certainly surrounding countries are, 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 it's an opportunity, but it's a concern. Um, and that's certainly going to be part of the geopolitical, uh, 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 part, part of the geopolitics of, of Asia uh, is, is that as well. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so I, that's uh, my, uh, my close to the, um, uh, to, to my lecture for, for this, uh, this, this term. Um, so, uh, I, I did, I don't, well, you, you, you have that. We were, we were working on, uh, the Saudi, Arabia. Uh, you got the, you were getting the Saudi, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the oil data, 
uh, for yeah, yeah. Uh, right. It's um, and I think you saw that there's no they there's zero yeah. basically zero trade. They won't sell Israel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I I wanted to show you like Norway and the UK to see we uh, you know you'd have to look probably from the European countries, probably Russia, yeah, yeah, Russia, Russia uh, Europe. Are, are, are probably selling them uh, selling them oil. Another very interesting thing that you may want to take a look at uh, with that is um, uh, uh, Israel has found a very large gas field off of uh, uh, off of their coast. So, so actually, Israel has a lot of natural gas now, and and they're in the process of developing. They thought they had oil. It turns out they have a lot of natural gas. And, and the natural gas should be sufficient uh, to supply their needs, and they should be able also to export. There should be enough gas uh, for exporting. One problem, I, I believe, is that uh, uh, Cyprus, uh, Cy Cyprus wants to develop their gas. And the, and the problem is, is that Cyprus is divided into Greek and Turkish. The, 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 there's a there's a, a Turkish uh, uh, speaking uh, government on the north side of Cyprus, and a Greek speaking government on the south side. Technically, the whole island is part of Cyprus and part of the EU, but and so but only but practically only the south part uh, is. So now, the south part wants to develop their natural gas fields. Um, and the Turkish government is, is threatening. It, they're having a, a major dispute because the Turkish government says they should be sharing the revenue with the north part of, of, uh, of Turkey. I'm sorry, of, of, of Cyprus. Now, the reason why I mention that with Israel is, is that there, there's a pipeline. There, there's a pipeline that's being discussed, a gas pipeline that's being discussed uh, with Europe that may there may be some problems uh, uh, with with that pipeline because of this this dispute and basically the, the Turks are threatening uh, threatening military action uh, over it they're threatening the uh, the Cyprus government with with some potentially military action if they go forward and, and do and, and and start the drilling for natural gas so it's an interesting <laughs> it's that and that's a conflict that's gone on for more than 40 years. I, I actually remember uh, when it when it happened in, in 1974, uh, when the, when uh, Turkey, uh, basically Turkey, uh, took the, the northern half of Cyprus. And uh, um, but uh, uh, so that that's something that could be having an impact on your what if you're interested in Israel and and where Israel is getting its. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's relationship with the world in terms of, uh, uh, of both buying oil and selling its natural gas. So I, I just, just to keep that in, you may want to, you may want to look that. That's, I, I think I read that yesterday. Or, or, the, yeah, it's real, this is real new, new stuff. So, um, uh, so, um, yeah, exciting stuff. Uh, what I, I wanted to do now is, um, and, is is discuss the uh, or I want to play uh, uh, two videos of, of work that students did last year, and, and um, so what I what I'd like to do I'm going to turn off uh, uh, the light and play um, two very nice uh, uh, these were very uh, very nice uh, reports uh, um, uh, that basically to give you a feel for. The kind of work. Um, the, the the one uh, the one is on Qatar, uh, so uh, a very interesting, uh, very good uh, good work on uh, on, on Qatar. Uh, the student did a lot of a lot of work. Sent me, she really bothered me. Uh, said always telling me stuff and and and, but she really did a great piece of work. And the other one is is a student that, that uh, uh, did something on Mongolia. Uh, very nice, uh, very basic, uh, very basic. I, uh, I think her analysis was a little bit more complicated. Uh, and what I want to show with uh, the Mongolia uh, is um, 
It's real basic uh, uh, analysis, but really some very good solid, uh, very good solid work. You know, keeping it, um, uh, keeping it very focused. It's very focused work, uh, very good quality. So I'm going to play those. I'd like to turn off the the light so that you can uh, you can see that um, see that clearly. And I want to make sure that the camera. Uh, uh, the camera clearly records that. Um, so, th and this is what they, this is the report, as I say, there's about 30 minutes each, uh, uh, about 30 minutes each. So you're just gonna see, well, this is what, uh, this is the kind of work that people, uh, uh, that people did. So I will get started with this. Can... Presentation topic is Qatar's fastest economic growth. The reason why I chose this topic is because in the class I learned that the Qatar is the most uh, one of the country which has the fastest GDP uh, per capita growth rate in the world. So I uh, had an interest in Qatar's economics. So I decided to choose um, this topic. First, um, I will explain the outline of this presentation. So introduction, economic and vertical background, research question, then the trade pattern effects, database analysis, map analysis, presentation future development of Qatar, and then conclusion. And then I will answer for the research question. So let's begin with the introduction. Qatar is the country located in the Middle East. It is the emirate on the west coast of Persian Gulf. The capital is Doha. The population is estimated at 744,000 and more than 83% of the population lives in capital. The region of the state is Islam and the Islamic law is the main source of legislation. Arabic is the official language and the English is widely spoken in the country. The official currency is the Qatar Real. The exchange party has been set at a fixed rate of one Qatar Real for $0.27. Also, what is important, Qatar is a country which is very rich in natural resources. And let's move on to economic and political background. So I'm going to talk about the chronological background in Qatar, the political or economic history of Qatar. So in 1700s, uh, immigrants established burying and trading settlements along the coast, which is the present day of Qatar. And in 1967, conflict with neighboring Bahrain over territorial claims. As a result, the Doha is all but destroyed. In 1939, oil, oil reserve is discovered. Exploitation is delayed by World War II but oil comes to replace pearling and fishing as Qatar's main source of revenue at this time. So as this leads to 1950s, oil revenues fund the expansion and modernization of Qatar's infrastructure. In 1968, Qatar negotiated with the Bahrain and present-day United Arab Emirates on forming a federation as Britain announces that it will withdraw its forces from the Gulf. And nine, finally, in 1971, Qatar becomes independent on September 3rd. And in my, um, on March 2001, Qatar settles long-running border disputes with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. In February uh, 2004, former Chechen president is killed by, was killed by explosion, explosion in Doha, where he had been living. In Qatar, hence, life Russia deteriorate. Um, I mean, Qatar hands life sentences to two Russian agents over the killing. So the relation with Russia is was uh, deteriorate, and the pair was extradited in Russia in late 2004. And in June uh, 2005, Qatar's first written constitution comes into effect, in providing for some. Uh, democratic reforms. And in 2005 November, Qatar and the United States launched a 
fourteen dollars fourteen billion dollars joint project to build the world's largest uh, liquefied natural gas plant. In addition, most of the gas will be exported to the United States. In September 2007, Qatar and Dubai became the two biggest shareholders of the London Stock Exchange, and it is the world's third largest um, stock exchange. And in March 2008, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church becomes the first official Christian church um, in, in inaugurated in Qatar. This was a big event uh, because the Christian were previously not permitted to worship to, uh, openly. In December 2010, Qatar wins a bid to host a 2022nd a 22 FIFA World Cup. And in March 2011, Qatar joins international military operation in Libya. In 2014, in September, Qatar and four other Arab states uh, take part in the United States led airstrikes on Islamic states mil uh, militants in Syria. And coming to the recent history, March 2015, Qatar and four other GCC states take part in Saudi-led airstrikes on rebels, rebels on rebels in Yemen. And this increases immigrants in Qatar. And in May uh, 2015, Amnesty International publishes a report on Qatar's promise to improve mi immigrants' workers' rights in run up to uh, 2022 Football World Cup, which is the government in, um, are disputing. And Amnesty says progress is limited to non existent. Um, so Qatar has issues of foreign worker, uh, which will uh, I will explain later in this presentation. So let's move on to the research question. So throughout my presentation, my research question is: What are the effects of becoming the world's highest per capita GDP growth rate? So next, trade pattern and effects. First, I'm going to analyze Qatar's trade pattern and its effects. Qatar is the 35th largest export economy in the world and resulting the positive trade balance, which exported, uh, which uh, Qatar exported um, $125 billion and imported $32.8 billion in 2014. From 2009 to 2014, Qatar had increased at the new rate of uh, 22.5%. Okay, let's start with Qatar's exports in 2014. As you can see, oil and natural gas are crucial components of its trade revenues. Uh, much of Qatar's export earnings are derived from these industries and reinvested into imports, will, um, imports, which I will going to analyze later in the slide. So this is the big factor of sustain uh, Qatar's rapidly growing economy, resulting trade surplus until 2014. So you can see petroleum gas is the biggest export here. Uh, it is 58%. It is more than half of exports. Uh, next, crude petroleum here is the second largest export uh, with its 27% uh, of exports. And third, third refined petroleum, uh, refined petroleum with 8.1%. And this clearly shows that the main export is petroleum, this brown part. So petroleum includes transport station fuels, fuel oils for heating and electricity generation, and asphalt and uh, road oil, and uh, uh, feedstocks used to make used to make chemicals, plastics, and uh, synthetic materials that are found in nearly everything we use in daily life. So other exports are very few. Uh, the percentage data colored pink is nitrogen. Uh, nitrogenous fertilizers here, and while light pink here is uh, ethylene polymers, and brown shows 
the raw iron bars and other small percentage are uh, precious metals or gas turbines or which are exported very few. And as an effect to the economy, um, petroleum is the cornerstone of Qatar's economy and accounts for more than 70% uh, of total government revenue, more than 60% uh, of gross domestic uh, product. And it is roughly 80% uh, of export earnings. So, next, where does Qatar exports do? Let's look at the exports on petroleum gas uh, data in 2014. So this data indicates that the Qatar exports 24 percent of petroleum gas ex uh, exports to Japan, followed by uh, South Korea, then India, then China, and other Asia. Across continent, Qatar exports to mostly Asia, this red part, and then Europe, purple, and very few in other continents like South America, Oceania, and North America. And we want to the next slide. Where does Qatar export uh, <coughs> crude petroleum? Uh, previous uh, uh, slide was uh, petroleum <coughs> gas, but this slide is the crude petroleum. So it is the uh, which is the second uh, biggest export among the total export. So Japan. Again, is the 37 percent the Japan the biggest, and followed by the Singapore, and then South Korea and other Asia. So other continent is Oceania, very thin orange here, and Africa yellow, and then the Europe purple. So and both data shows that more than half of its export destination is Asia, this red part, and then. Uh, followed by Europe or Oceania, and we can analyze that Japan is the biggest, uh, a big trade partner with Qatar. Okay, let's move on to Qatar's imports in 2014. In Qatar, uh, Qatar imported uh, 32.8 billion dollars, and it is the 60. Fifth largest importer in the world, so Qatar does less import than exports, but still imports increased 14.8 percent annualized rate from 2009 to 14. As you can see in this data, cars are the biggest uh, import, which is the 83, uh, 8.3 percent of total imports, and then. Qatar imports variety of products led by mainly transportation. Uh, this part it is, is the Some transportation. So uh, for the transportation by Euro, car, Oceania, and we can analyze that aircraft plans, parts, wrong here. and delivery trucks. Oh, I think I. Okay, I think I accidentally. Okay, um, let me back this up just a little bit. Because I was trying to understand why is this, and it, I, I accidentally started uh, both of them. Then I realized something was wrong. There we go. Okay. There we'll just start here. Okay. There we go. In Qatar, uh, Qatar imported uh, thirty-two point eight billion dollars, and it is the sixty-fifth largest importer in the world. So Qatar does less importing than exports. But still, imports increased 14.8 percent annualized rate from 2009 to 14. As you can see in this data, cars are the biggest uh, import, which is the 83, uh, 8.3 percent of total import. It just uh, th this is uh, I believe this is from the World Bank site, so you can actually go and, and get what what she did was she took it just right off of. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a screenshot of, of the, of, of, of from the World Bank. Uh, so, so this data is just, it, it's a very nice way to, um, uh, yeah, if you've seen it, um, 
Yeah. Um, is the World Bank? Or is it the UN Trade Set? Maybe it's the UN Trade Data. It might be the UN Trade Data. But it's it's there. Um, any rate, I think maybe it is the UN Trade Data. And you go to the. Uh, um, uh, but it's just very nicely laid out. It's very so. So you can just see visually, uh, and she, and she uses this quite well to uh, in her presentation. And then, uh, Qatar imports variety of products, led by mainly transportation. Uh, this part it is, is the transportation. So transportation <coughs> include cars, planes, helicopters, aircraft, plants, parts, and delivery trucks and special purpose ships for buses or other transportation. So transportation is a 25% of the imports in Qatar, followed by machines and chemical product. So in next slide, uh, as Qatar's largest import was car, so I'm going to analyze where does Qatar import car from. Again, Japan is the biggest part. So, um, with its 35% of car imports are from Japan. This clearly shows that Japan is a big trade partner of Qatar. So, as a matter of fact, Japan influences and involves in Qatar's economy through trades, both imports and exports. And Qatar imports car from uh, other Europe. And here's uh, South America and Oceania as well. Okay, so I analyze trades in Qatar and now let's move on to the data analysis. So database analysis. So first, um, I'm going to explain Qatar's uh, GDP and then current accounts, capital accounts, and balance of payments. So the data is in billion and it is from the National Account Statistic Data of the United Nations uh, 2003, um, no, 2007 to 2013. So first, uh, GDP. It is a GDP by expenditure at constant prices. So as you can see, each component, component is growing rapidly from 2003 to 2013. So particularly trade balance, as I explained uh, previously here. So here, um, Qatar has positive trade balance. Um, take a look at the components at exports and um, imports. Uh, this is export and this is the import. So both are growing rapidly. And in the case of export, let's see from 2003 to 13, its number is growing about six times and import is growing more than eight times. So these are the dramatic growth in trades. As all these results at the bottom of the chart, so GDP growth in the Qatar is very rapid and economy is developing very fast. So this at the bottom, it's the GDP. Um, so this is very big economic growth. And in 2013, here, uh, GDP growth uh, grew more than five times greater than that of 2003. So this is a big, very big. And I might be a little complicated uh, to see, it might be real complicated to see the number in this PowerPoint. So I made this um, GDP growth into a graph. So here's the graph of GDP in constant price from 2003 to 38 in Qatar. So it is almost straight constant rapid growth of the GDP. Very, very rapid. So not experiencing any declines over the decade. And so led by this huge GDP growth, Let's analyze current accounts, capital accounts, and balance of payments. So this is the chart I made for the current account, capital account, balance of payments overall. So the data is from 2007 to 13. As some of the data from 2003 to 6 were missing, so current, so the current accounts here is uh, showing negative, 
and capital accounts are increasing its number over time. And the balance of payments are also increasing rapidly from 2003. So let's take a closer, more closer look in following slides. I will explain the calculation. So, so here the the the, the current account. Um, let's see what she uh, would be negative, probably because of foreign investment. And so there, there, there's, there's so much foreign investment that would have gone into it for, for the development of their And also the analysis of, of the results. So here are the calculation I did to make the database. So these are the components of current account. And as you all know, it can be calculated by net exports plus sum of compensation employee and property income from the rest of the world minus sum of compensation of employees and property income to the rest of the world plus current transfers uh, from the rest of the world minus current transfer to the rest of the world. And the result in 2007 to 2013 is the number underlined here. So next, capital account can be calculated by the here, showing here. Capital uh, calculated by capital account changes in liabilities and net worth uh, less capital transfers payable minus capital transfer uh, receivable. So result number under right number is becoming larger. Here are the results. Um, uh, it is becoming larger till uh, 2013. And lastly, in the case of balance of payments, at the very bottom, uh, I calculated by adding current account and capital account. However, I needed to use the data from net exports that is in current price, not at constant price, which I used in calculating, cal uh, calculating current account. So here, I will uh, briefly explain about difference between current price and constant price. Constant price data series are designed to compare cross periods. On the other hand, when making balance of payment series, you need to use the current price time series data. This data is what you need to make the balance of payments database. It can be found from table 1.1, current price data in national account statistics, EX minus IM data. We use this for calculating balance of payments. So result is here at the very bottom. <coughs> Under right number, again, rapid growth in the balance of payments from 2007, uh, more than five times larger in 2013. Now, I will analyze closer, explain situation which make these results in Qatar's economy. First, let's analyze current account. I use data from table 1.3 and 4.2 as I explained in previous slide. So net export shows dramatic increase as I mentioned before. So the positive trade balance is the influence of the surplus. Also, Qatar has large outflow to the rest of the world and thus it leads to that the Qatar is a net lender to the rest of the world. This proves that look at the components of sum of compensation and employees and property income to the rest of the world. Here. Um, mm, right. The number is very large. And these payments are for uh, fallen uh, fallen, uh, fallen workers to their home countries. Um, the payments to payments to the other countries. In fact, Qatar has much fallen labor force. The much of the labor force in fallen workers in Qatar. This proves the outflow in the data. So current transfer to the rest of the world show big outflow as well. So now I explained that falling labor is the reason of outflow. So I would like to explain about Qatar's falling labor and those issues. So let me explain this background here. 
As I mentioned in the introduction slide in the beginning of the presentation, in fact, Qatar has immigrants more than 1.6 million, according to the authorities, and it made up more than 90% of Qatar's workforce. Most of them are from India and Pakistan or Nepal. According to the Amnesty International, um, mi migrant workers, including domestic workers and those who have employed in high profile construction projects, they continue to face exploitation and also abuse. Also, discrimination against women remain in both law and practice. So that's penalty remaining in force. In addition, no execution were reported in Qatar. So this is very large issues of human rights in Qatar. And exit uh, visa system prevents workers from leaving the country without permission, and they cannot even change jobs without permission under Qatari uh, sponsorship law and also the kafala system. So women are also abused, including forced labor low pay, late payment, or human trafficking. The immigrant workers of the situation is like modern slaves, and international media attention raised while the Qatar has become 2020, uh, 2022 a FIFA World Cup host country. So as construction increases, increases in infrastructure project, more uh, workers are required, and it indicated these problems to be accelerated, and at the same time, it will small steps. Of, it will be a small steps of opportunity of getting world's attention to huge issues of labor in Qatar. So now back on to back to the data analysis. So I will move on to the capital accounts data analysis of Qatar from 2007 to 2013. So I used table 4.3 non-financial corporations. The number of capital transfer payable here is increasing uh, from 2007 to 13, more than four times bigger, and also capital transfer uh, receive, receivable has experienced huge rapid growth. Resulting in this. Uh, capital accounts in Qatar increased from uh, more than three times from 2007 to 2013. So third, I will explain the balance on payments data analysis. So it is very large, a very large at the bottom uh, in the result of balance of payments. So the calculation is I have already explained that current account uh, plus capital accounts, uh, which uh, current account uses the data that uses a net export data, which are from table 1.1 GDP by expenditure at the current price, not the constant price. So in the result balance of payments in 2013, it's a dramatically huge number. And also a positive and additional, in addition the positive trade balance means that a Qatar's saving exceeds its domestic investment and it have the positive outflow of the capital to the world. So therefore, trade balance is the most important part of the balance of payments. I also wanted to introduce the uh, financial sector. This is connected with the current account and the capital account. In Qatar, financial sector has been increased radically over the decade. And this data is from Table 2.2, uh, value added by industry at the constant price. And I think that uh, I, I think that the changes in capital account um, may be because of the rapid expansion in the capital account and also the growth in some of compensation and employees and profit income from the rest of the world might be connected with the growth of this financial sector. And as you can see, I made up the graph and we can see the great growth of the financial sector. It's, it is incredible growth, almost straight. So next, the map analysis. So in my presentation, I would like to introduce these three map analysis, GDP, balance of payments, GDP percentage, and the FDI, foreign direct investments. 
So as I mentioned in the beginning, Qatar is a very small country located here in the Middle East. So I will talk about the map data of Qatar within the Middle East. So let's begin with the GDP map analysis in the Middle East. So as Qatar has highest GDP growth rate and has a the huge positive trade balance in a small population, per capita GDP is a very huge among the continent. Here, Qatar uh, shows very deep blue, whereas big oil countries Saudi Arabia has less and other countries like Sudan, Egypt, Afghanistan, Pakistan or Syria have very red, uh, which they these countries have now serious conflict. And Kuwait or United Arab Emirates also have deep root. But still, Qatar seems to be the highest. Okay, next, the balance of payments in Middle East. Again, Qatar has very deep root among the, along with uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab, also Libya, we can see from Latin America, and in the case of Middle East, um, Iran, uh, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan have not reported on this data, which are colored gray, and Pakistan has a very deep red, and countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates are very big natural resources producer, um, resulting a uh, blue color. So next, I will talk about the foreign direct investment. So here I divided into infra and outfra of capital. The left map shows a per capita inward foreign direct investment for the Middle East relative to the world average per capita inward for the period, uh, period of the 2010 to 14. And on the map right shows per capita in, in uh, per capita um, inward uh, foreign direct investment for the Middle East relative to world average per capita um, outward for the period uh, 2010 to 2014. So this is the inward and this is the outward. So we can see the many red, deep red colors except Kuwait and Qatar has deep blue on the left map here and shows so and Saudi Arabia, Oman and United Arab are average or light blue on the right right map. So let's see Qatar, it has deep blue in inward of FDI. This can be backed up with the fact that the Qatar has positive trade balance because of the natural resources. And also, outward of Qatar, um, FDI it seems almost average in the Middle East, uh, where Qatar is colored almost white or uh, uh, very, really light blue. So next, uh, I will move on to the present and future development of Qatar. So here I will briefly explain about the main situation of Qatar and its effect to the future. So Qatar is a place where world meets and it is originally famous for oil producer, also historically famous for uh, famous with fishing and trade opportunities. But nowadays, uh, Qatar is an important part in the global market. It is the fastest growing economy and in 2012, a real GDP growth rate of 18%. And Qatar has been consistently ranked among the top three fastest growing economies in the world. Also, it is sixth highest country for income per capita and first among GCC countries. So following factors are the factors which potentially have the positive uh, impact on social and economic standards of living in Qatar. And in addition, Qatar hosts FIFA World Cup in 2022 and this will bring huge economic positive impacts to Qatar, for sure. However, from 2014, oil price has dropped. Um, 
uh, this this news is I think it's famous uh, these days in the media, and the IMF um, indicated that the Qatari government risks po posting a budget deficit in 2016 as low oil prices continue to challenge against energy dependent nations within the Middle East. Uh, so Qatar's uh, reliance on oil is uh, really unsustainable. So Qatar's oil reserves are expected to run dry by 2023 and the Qatari government has since focused on its attention to, to developing the natural gas industry. So, uh, last, uh, finally, the conclusion. I would like to summarize uh, briefly throughout my presentation. So, I will um, um, here I will say the conclusion. So, Qatar is one of the world's highest oil producer, very rich in natural resources, and having very fastest growing economy. And Qatar is quotes export petroleum for more than 50% of trade exports. And the destination is mainly Japan. So it means that Japan is uh, the big uh, trade partner with Qatar, uh, both imports and exports. So imports, Qatar imports almost half of total imports on transportation like cars, helicopter, buses, or trains. And Qatar is more than uh, Ninety percent of the labor force is immigrants, and therefore the capital outflow to the foreign country, and also having the uh, difficult issues about the labor force, uh, like forced labor or abuses, and also having positive trade balance. Qatar, among the Middle East, uh, it has one of the highest highest exporter exporter. Uh, biggest producer of natural gas or oils. And in these results, having the highest GDP per capita within the Middle East, and also having the highest inward um, foreign direct investment, FDI, and so on. So finally, the answers for the research question. And this is important. So this main point I explained in the whole presentation, we can bring the answer for the research question I presented in the beginning. So the question was, what are the effects of becoming the world's highest per capita GDP growth rate? And here are the answers. Qatar is actually a wealthy country in terms of income per, per capita, and the Qatar population is very small. And the biggest reason is its positive trade balance affected by the huge oil produce. Oil has given Qatar a per capita GDP uh, ranking among the highest in the world. And Qatar's proved uh, reserves of natural gas exceed um, 7,000 cubic kilometer and more than 5% of the world total. It is the third largest in the world. And production and exports of natural gas are becoming increasingly very important. And so the long-term goals feature the, the development of offshore petroleum and the diversification of the Qatar's economy. So here, here are the sources that I use uh, through my presentation. And now this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. So that was that uh, her presentation on, uh, on 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 Qatar. Probably a little bit more. Uh, I, I I think if, um, I think that first part, the the discussion on the historical background wasn't really necessary. But she did. She covered a lot of a lot of ground, a lot of different things. Um, I don't think you have to necessarily cover that much. But certainly, in watching this, it's a little bit more than 30 minutes, a lot of a good background. You get a very good sense, uh, if you know nothing about Qatar, and, and I think you may have never heard of Qatar, uh, when you came in this class, well now you know a lot. Um, and just the update, as you know, uh, they've had that, uh, I, I talked about in the class, um, 
uh, what's going on uh, with the conflict uh, there uh, with, the, uh, with other Middle Eastern countries. And now you can see the importance of Japan. I mentioned that. She, she talked about that. It's a big uh, source of... Uh, uh, so no, this was a very good... Uh, I, I, I liked what she did. I thought she did a very good job. Now I'm going to talk, uh, show you the other presentation I'm going to talk about here. And that is... This is on Mongolia. Hello, my name is Hayat Sakurama, and I want to make a presentation about Mongolia and its place in the global economy and in the global financial system. At first, I want to explain the reason why I chose Mongolia for my final presentation. As we learned from the map in the class, compared to world average, inward foreign, inward foreign direct investment as a percentage of GDP in Mongolia is very high. And the balance of payments as a percentage of GDP in Mongolia is significantly negative. These things are unique in East Asia, so I came to want to research why it is and why Mongolia is attracting a large amount of FDI. This is the reason why I chose Mongolia. Now, I want to give a brief introduction to Mongolia. Mongolia is located in East Asia and shares a common border with China and Russia. The capital city is Lampardo, and Mongolia has a land uh, has a land area of about 1.5 million square kilometers, which is four times as large as Japan. But the population of Mongolia is only around 3 million. So, Mongolia is known as a country having the lowest population density in the world. Political system is in the public, and the monetary unit of Mongolia is Togrom. Next, I want to talk about Mongolia economy. Recently, Mongolia came to be known as one of the resource richest countries, and Mongolia economy is growing rapidly based on their, uh, their uh, mineral resources. It is said that today, more than 80 kinds of mineral resources are found in Mongolia, and the number of mineral deposits is about 6,000. Especially, Mongolia mines iron, molybdenum, copper, zinc, <coughs> gold, silver, fluoxper, steam coal, coking coal, and lignite as a main mineral resources. I made this table based on world mining, world mining data, and this table shows the amount of production of each main resource from 2010 to 2014 and the world ranking of them in 2014. Let's take a close look at this table. As you can see, almost all production of, min uh, of main mineral resources tend to increase, especially the amount of production of iron, copper, gold, silver, and coking coal is increasing with so largely from 2000, uh, 2013 to 2014. As a matter of fact, this rapid increase of the amount of production of Mongolia mineral resources has a strong connection of the large amount of FDI. When you look at gold, you notice that the amount of production of gold in 2014, which was uh, 29th in the world, was about twice as much as the amount of production of gold in 2013 which was ranked 38. Yeah. This skyrocketing growth of gold in Mongolia is remarkable and has significant influence on Mongolian economy because gold is precious mineral resource. Even though the amount of molybdenum and phosphor uh, did not make it, did not make big changes, still these mineral resources have an uh, influence on Mongolia economy because Molybdenum was ranked 10th and 
so the iceberg was like uh, sad in 2014. As I said, Mongolia has about 6,000 mineral deposits and their development has been in progress. So it is clear that the amount of, uh, the amount of mineral resources in Mongolia will continue to increase and it will have great impact on Mongolia economy. Next, I want to take a close look at exports and imports in Mongolia. I made this table based on World Bank data and this table shows the top 5 exported products to the world by Mongolia and its trade value and the top 5 imported products from the world by Mongolia and its trade value in 2014. Mineral resources account for around 90% of Mongolia economy, Mongolia exports. So, after all, exports of mineral resources are key to Mongolia economy. Of course, the top five exported products to the world by Mongolia were mineral resources, which were copper, coal, oil, iron, and gold. These top 5 exported products account for about 85% of total exports in Mongolia. Uh, when we take a look at the top 5 imported products, we can notice that these imported products can be used in order to develop, uh, develop deposits. Mongolia imports a large amount of products that have relationship with mining. This table shows the top five countries to which Mongolia exported in 2014 and the percentage of total exports. Uh, the, and the top five countries from which Mongolia imported goods in 2014 and the percentage of total imports. It is remarkable that China is the biggest trade partner in both export and import. Especially, China account for about 88% uh, of total exports. So, it appears that China is a very important country for Mongolia in order to make economic growth for years to come. <coughs> Japan is the third biggest exporter in 2014, but in 2015, Japan became the first country that, conclude, that concluded uh, an economic partnership agreement, EPA, with Mongolia. So, it is expected that the trade relationship between Japan and Mongolia will be stronger. <coughs> Next. I want to introduce the budget of strategic importance. Mongolia government chose 15 deposits as deposits of strategic importance based on whether making huge profits or not. This table shows a 50 deposit of strategic importance and uh, what mineral resources each deposit has and where each deposit is located. The development of each deposit, deposit is in progress, and it is estimated that this deposit will make huge economic growth that Mongolia has never experienced. As I told, Mongolia came to be known as one of the resource richest countries, and a lot of enterprises around the world uh, have a big interest have a big interest in Mongolia. Uh, mineral, resources, pos mineral resources possibilities, that is, there are huge amount of mineral resources that have not mined yet. Especially, many enterprises around the world pay attention to deposits of strategic importance and they are making FTI in Mongolia in order to make huge profits. This is the reason why Mongolia is attracting a large amount of FDI. 
Above all, Rio Tinto, which is the largest mining company in the world, is making huge amount of FDI in Oyu Torgoi, that is one of the departments of strategic importance. This Tafan Torgoi is also one of the, one of the deposits of uh, strategic importance as well as oil Torgoi. This. So, I want to take a look at the development of oil Torgoi and Tafan Torgoi. First, I want to take a look at oil Torgoi. Oil Torgoi is located in uh, 550 km, km south from Ulaanbaatar, which is a capital city in Mongolia, and 80, uh, 80 km north from China. The word uh, Oyu Torgoi means treasure hill or turquoise hill. And Oyu Torgoi is known as the uh, World's largest, uh, world's, world's largest deposit of copper and gold. It is estimated that uh, the amount of deposit of copper is about uh, 26 million tons. Gold is about, gold is about 10,100 tons. Silver is about uh, 5,200 tons and more good enough is about uh, 82,000 tons. This amount, of, this amount of deposit is unprecedented, unprecedented in the world. And it is said that 4.500,000 tons of copper is mined every year, and this output of copper accounts for 3% of the, of the amount of production of copper in the world. Furthermore, as I said, the amount of deposit of copper is about uh, 26 million tons, which, uh, which was 280 billion dollars. And the amount of deposit of gold is uh, 10,100 tons, which was more than uh, 70 billion dollars. Therefore, or the tall boy has uh, 30, 30 times as much value as Mongolia GDP. This is amazing, and we can understand why Oi Torgoi is attracting a large amount of FDI. The development of deposit in Mongolia needs a vast amount of infrastructure construction, such as rain, snow, electric power, and water. And it also has spillover effect on mining surprise material, architecture, uh, architecture, traffic, and so on. So it appears that the development of deposit has a good effect on the, on a lot of uh, Mongolian industries. Second. I want to look at the process of the development of Oyu Torgoi. In 1996, Magna Copper, that is mining company, started to uh, research in South Gold, where Oyu Torgoi was located. And, and then, uh, Magna Copper was uh, bought by BHP which is uh, one of the largest mining companies in the world in the same year. In 1997 and 1998, BHP did boring exploration in Oitorgoi and found copper and gold. In 2000, Ivahoe Mines, which is big, uh, which is big mining company, got the right to explore exploration from BHP. From 2001 to 2000, uh, 2005, Ivan Mines con continued to explore uh, Oitorgoi by, in by investment 
it costed uh, 2.5 million dollars. In 2006, Rio Tinto, which is the largest mining company in the world, as I mentioned, uh, invested in Ivanhoe mines and got, uh, got uh, 9.95 percent of stock of it. Ivanhoe Mines made a declaration that Ivanhoe Mines will start joint business with Rio Tinto in the same year. In 2006, sorry, sorry, in 2009, the investment agreement was made among the uh, Mongolian government, Ivanhoe Mines and Rio Tinto. Uh, Mongolian government on 34% uh, of interest of oil turbine project by this agreement, but uh, in contrast, uh, Mongolian government had to cover 34% of investment amount. Ivanhoe Mines and Rio Tinto owned the uh, remains of interest, interest of oil turbine. Uh, in 2011, uh, Mongolian government consulted with Ivanhoe Mines for uh, reviewing investment agreement in 2009 because Mongolian government thought that 34% uh, of interest on oil turbine for Mongolian government was too small and they wanted to increase ratio like that. The reason of it was that even though Mongolian government could increase the ratio of interest up to five, uh, 50 percent, 50 percent, uh, they could do it after 30 years. After 30 years, because it was defined, defined in investment agreement, and there was a chance that Ivanhoe Mines would mine uh, most high profit areas in first 30 years. However. Ivanhoe Mines rejected their, their concept. In 2012, Rio Tito got 51% uh, of stock of Ivanhoe Mines, so Ivanhoe Mines was affiliated with Rio Tito and changed the company name from Ivanhoe Mines to Takwas Hill, Takwas Hill Resources, which means oil Torigoy, as I said. In 2013, Mongolian government and Rio Tinto started to operate and 5,800 tons of copper was exported to China. Originally, it was supposed, it was supposed to uh, second phase investment would start after this first export. <coughs> However, mainly the matter of tax and, uh, and the calculation of cost of development created a mismatch between uh, Mongolia, Mongolia government and Rio Tinto, so the development of Oritorico did not make progress. After all, the negotiation uh, lasted for two years, and in 2015, Mongolia government and Rio Tinto achieved a consensus. This is the process of development of Oritorico. As I said, uh, Mongolian government and Rio Tinto achieved a consensus in 2015, uh, and the project has started on the uh, started on the full scale since 2016. Therefore, it is expected to uh, expected if Oritorico project goes on smoothly, export of main uh, main mineral resources in Mongolia and GDP will increase to a large extent and Mongolia economy will grow. Next, I want to take a look at the development of Taban Turgoy. Next, uh -oh. I want to take a look at the...
Next, I want to take a look at the development of Taiwan Turgoi. Taiwan Turgoi is located in 540 kilometers south from Ulaanbaatar and 200, uh, 250 kilometers north from the Chinese border. Taiwan Turgoi is known as one of the biggest coal mines and it is estimated that the amount of deposit of cooking coal is 1.8 billion, do billion tons. This amount of cooking coal is so huge. For example, the amount of imported cooking coal by Japan in 2000, 2012 was 70 million tons and this means that the amount of deposit of cooking coal in Taiwan Turgoi is the same as the uh, 26 years worth of the amount of deposited cooking coal by Japan. Do, do you know cooking this coal? Cooking uh, coal. Cooking coal is used. Uh, you use it in the manufacture of steel. When you when you when you manufacture steel, you use. Uh, that's that that's the type of coal uh, that you use uh, as part of the manufacturing process uh, to make steel. And that. There was a big difference between Oi Torigoi and Taiwan Torigoi. It was whether uh, government owned or not. Taiwan Torigoi was 100% government owned mine, so LDNS Taiwan Torigoi company was made, which is 100% uh, government owned. But LDNS Taiwan Torigoi decided to co develop. Co -develop with uh, foreign capital. So, Mongolian government also decided to conduct international bid for Taiwan Turgoi based on the assumption that uh, Mongolian government owes more than 51% of interest of Taiwan Turgoi. At present, international bid for uh, Taiwan Turgoi is still going on and Taiwan Turgoi has not developed yet. In 2016, international bid for construction of heat power plant was conducted, and Marbelli Corporation, which is a Japanese major company, got the right to do right to it. As I said, Taiwan Torgoi remained under underdeveloped, so it appears that if Taiwan Torgoi project start and Starts as a huge amount of cooking coal is produced, more and more FDI will be attracted in Mongolia. And Mongolia can make economic growth to a large extent. Therefore, today, uh, further development of oil turgoy and carbon turgoy is a prime task for uh, Mongolia government. Finally, I want to analyze national accounts data in Mongolia. This table shows uh, Mongolia GDP component data at current price from 2005 to 2014. I want to compare output changes from uh, 2005 to 2014. However, as we learn in the class, we cannot make comparison across time. Uh, using data in current price because the price was changing over the entire entire period so we need to use data based on constant price in order to make comparison this is Mongolia GDP component data at constant prices from uh, 2005 to 2014 As you can see, Mongolia GDP has growing rapidly along with household and government consumption expenditures. Both exports and import has increased so rapidly, but Mongolia remains a trade deficit country because net export is negative. Investing investment has also grown.
Next is Mongolian GDP component share of GDP. Uh, from uh, 2005 to 2014. As you can see, uh, household consumption expenditure and investment as a investment as a main component of GDP, and both investment and imports, yeah, both uh, both investment and import share in 2012 are highest. It appears that government consumption expenditure share uh, looks stable. Other component share tend to increase, but uh, investment has its ups and downs. This table shows uh, Mongolia GDP components year on year percentage uh, percent changes between uh, 2005 and uh, 2014. When you look at component changes from uh, 2013 to 2014, uh, you will notice that uh, the, the most dramatic component changes. Investment decreased, decreased by 44% and export, uh, exports decreased by 52%. I think that uh, this huge increase of export is because in because uh, in 2013, uh, Mongolia government and Rio Tinto started to operate in Uruguay, and as we look at the first part of this presentation in 2014, Mongolia produced a large amount of iron and gold and exported them. Yeah, just to, uh, it can be a little bit confusing the way he did this, but uh, it's, this is actually like a, uh, a, a in consumption 2013-2014, it's actually 9.1% growth. He puts 109. So, so that's how he's doing it. it, it it's not wrong. It's just, it just can be confusing. You just, just have to keep clear what, how, how he's that, reporting. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, investment decreased so rapidly is a mismatch. Uh, is a mismatch between Mongolia government and the Tito. Even though Mongolia economy declined obvious, obviously due to financial crisis from 2008 to 2009, Mongolia kept 10% uh, GDP growth almost every year, mm -hmm. and this figure is so special. Next, uh, I want to analyze Mongolia current account components between 2005 and 2013. As you can see, compensation of employees and the property income to the rest of the world has increased since 2005. And it was much larger than compensation of employees and property income from the rest of the world. This means that the Interest on profit, interest and uh, profit, fit for the enterprise in Mongolia was much larger than that which uh, Mongolia comp Mongolia companies gained uh, gained in foreign countries. Compensation of employees of uh, employees and property income to the rest of the world has been the last has been the large part of current account in recent years. So this means that Mongolia has attracted more and more FDI and there is a large number of foreign workers in Mongolia. This current account data lacks the data in 2014. But uh, as I showed, uh, Mongolia, ex Mongolia exports increased by 52% from 2013 to 2014 and net export was almost zero. So we can uh, estimate that current account in 2014 came closer to surplus to a large degree.
Finally, I'm going to analyze the capital account and balance of payments components from 2008 to 2013. As you can see, capital account was positive over the entire period. And this, mean, uh, this means a large net inflow of capital into Mongolia. Balance of payments was becoming more and more negative over the period. This means that more and more Mongolian assets uh, were being sold for foreigners. But as I said, it is estimated that current account in 2014 came much closer to surplus. So balance of payments must have come closer to surplus. However, as we learned in the class, uh, negative, negative balance uh, Negative balance, uh, balance of payment is not necessarily a bad thing. Negative balance of payment can be positive for Mongolia. The reason why Mongolia balance of payment is negative is that uh, Mongolia has a huge amount of mineral resources and attract FDI. So FDI is the main reason. And this FDI is uh, intended for infrastructure, uh, infrastructure construction because it is necessary for mining. Therefore, we can conclude that uh, Mongolian negative balance of payment is a good thing for Mongolian economy. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. There it is. So. That gives you a good, uh, good sense that those were two uh, good presentations that were made last year. Uh, so we'll have that, um, have that uploaded so you'll be able to, to, to watch that and get, uh, uh, get a feel for your own, uh, your own work. Uh, now, you guys are, um, let's see, it's next, we're, we're talking next Thursday. Uh, so let's, um, yeah, please get, uh, I think I, I I haven't had much uh, uh, much material, so I want to make sure um, just to see what your progress is, where you're at. Please send me material so um, so that I can feel like you're you're making uh, making some uh, good progress. Um, so uh, well, that's the end of the uh, the end of the class. Um, thank you, and. Uh, oh. And I know we're, we'll, we'll go in. I'll meet you guys next Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I checked, Hidai is actually, you're, yeah, I, 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 I didn't realize, right? It, it, how far from uh, Higashi Ojima? Uh, I'm not familiar with Higashi because. You, you live up in the. I just moved to, move from, from I, I, I used to live in Chiba City. Okay. Yeah, so I just moved last year. Uh, yeah, I moved to Hirai, so I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Wait, what uh, station? Uh, what station do you work in? Station? Yes. Hirai. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what? Uh, uh, what? Jia. Uh, Jia. So so. Oh, the so so one. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. Right. So that's up up for. I I was actually at. Uh, I, I, I was walking around there last night, so I, it's, as I say, it's my neighborhood. I, you know, I, I, I walked over. Uh, no, I, I know the Q, of course, the, uh, the Q Nakagawa. Uh, I, yeah, Q Nakagawa, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. On, on, on the one side, of course, Arakawa. Uh -huh. So, no, I, I'm, it's a very familiar uh, area for me. So, no, well, um, so, well, I'll have a good idea how to. I might even be able just to walk uh, to go meet him. So, um, uh, well, we'll be in touch. Uh, please send me uh, your material, uh, uh, just uh, in, so uh, please, please be in touch with me over the next few days uh, uh, with, uh, so I can see where you're, where you're at. Um, and then you have, you'll have two weeks, uh, uh, but please, uh, uh, please start getting uh, some material to me to see. As I say, you can see that's what uh, um, the kind of work I, I think that's that's a representative of good quality. What I think is good quality work uh, that students did last year. So that 
Yeah, uh, hope that, hopefully that's a model, can be a, a good model for the kind of kind of work that uh, uh, the students did and what you were, I think that you're more than capable of doing yourself. So I look forward to that and thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be in touch. Let me just visit the